So we talked yesterday about how to construct a confidence interval for a difference of means, and today we're going to do the full state plan. Do conclude. <clears throat> do bigger apartments cost more money? Yes. All right. Now, look, Haley already answered the question, so we must not have to do the state plan. Do conclude. Okay, but wait. Here's the deal. We, uh, we, we, we want to take a little sample here, right? We want to see, like, uh, okay, um, maybe they uh, are different, but how different are they? That's why we make the interval, to give a, an estimate of how different are the prices of one- and two-bedroom apartments. So Cameron and Eric want to compare the cost of one- and two-bedroom apartments near campus. They collect the following data on monthly rents in dollars for a random sample of 10 apartments of each type. Here are their results. We have the one-bedrooms and the two-bedrooms. Construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval to estimate the true mean difference in the monthly rental rates of one- and two-bedroom apartments near campus. Campus. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go. State. We will estimate. Let's go. We will estimate. Now, here's what I challenge you. Don't forget that third word over spring break. When we are estimating, we are doing a confidence interval. Okay? So we will estimate. All right. We will estimate the true mean difference um yep in monthly oh it's almost like we're writing the sentence again rental rates of one and two bedroom apartments near campus so extra uh, at, there we go, at a 90% confidence level. Wasn't that fun? We're just having a good time today already. It's Friday. We're state plan doing and concluding. What better thing to do on a Friday? All right. Do you guys have any questions on the state part of that? Wouldn't that be great? All right. Plan. All right. Plan. We're going to plan. Here we go. Plan. We have an SRS of 10 one-bedroom apartments. And furthermore, we have an SRS of 10 two-bedroom apartments. Cool. That ensures that... X bar 1 minus X bar 2 is an unbiased estimator of mu 1 minus mu 2. That's why we just checked that condition. Did y'all know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Cool. Oh, dang. You know what I forgot? What did I forget? Do y'all see what I forgot? I forgot to say the word random. Dang. That's my random condition. Man, what a loser, Miss Lakey. All right. Independent. Independent. All right. I won't forget that one. All right. 10 times n1 has to be less than the population one. All right, so 10 times 10 is 100. Do you think that there are more than 100 one-bedroom apartments near campus? Probably. Population of one-bedroom apartments near campus. Yep, that's probably true. And then 10 times N2 has to be less than the population 2. So 10 times 10, again, has to be less than uh, the population of two bedroom apartments near campus. Oh, by the way, did I tell y'all y'all should write really small? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, you should have, but it's fine. It's fine if you didn't. Okay, so we have stated, we have planned partially, we're, ha we're two-thirds of the way there, random, independent. Um, any questions so far? What should we do now, you guys? Normal. We should check the normal condition, okay? All right. Well, uh, does everybody have this? Because I'm going to go ahead and erase so I have room to write my normal condition. Okay, cool.
So here we go for normal. Oh man, this is exciting. All right, guys, normal. So uh, how do I check the normal condition for means? Okay, so CLT fails, so that's off the table. Oh no, does it tell us what the shape of the population is? No. It sure does not. Guess what, you guys? We get to make not one, but two box plots. Hallelujah! All right, here's what I want you guys to do. I'm going to show you guys a cool trick. You ready? I want you to put the one bedroom apartment data into L1 and the two bedroom apartment data into L2. Do you guys remember how to put data in your calculator? Yeah. All right, stat edit. Put your one bedroom apartment data into L1. Put your two bedroom apartment data into L2 and then wait. Don't go any further after you put the data in. Did y'all not see this one coming? Surely you saw this coming. Yeah, you already had the data, and you're like, oh, man, we got to go with data. Dang it. Data, dang it. All right, we got our data in? No. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, my bad. I'll wait. Man, I love the sound of calculator buttons in the morning. It just, just invigorates me. All right, we got our data in? Yeah. Ooh, okay, we got about half and half now. Okay, good, good. This rent, so this rent is low. Yes, this rent is low. Look, it's because they're college kids. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe they're going to a college in middle of Nebraska. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, I mean, maybe they're in a sketchy part of town near campus because there are some sketchy parts of town near campuses. I'm just saying. All right. Is your data in? Okay. Do you remember how to make a box plot on your calculator? No. Oh, boy. All right. Ready? Everybody needs to follow along so that you don't get lost. You ready? Second, Y equals. That is your stat plot. Hit enter on plot one, hit enter on on, and then go to the fourth option, which is the box plot that shows outliers. Now, does it say underneath that list L1 and frequency one? Okay, guess what you have now? You would have the one bedroom apartment box plot. Everybody. Hit second Y equals again. Hit the right arrow to go to plot two. Or, I'm sorry, go hit the down arrow to go to plot two. Turn on plot two. Select the box plot with outliers. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. Okay. But now wait. Look at your list. What does it say? It says L1. That's just going to put a box plot of the L1 data on top of the original L1 data. So what do you need to do with that L1? You need to change that dude to L2. Do you guys remember how to get an L2? Second, Second and the number two. Second and the number two. That will change that list to L2. Now hit graph. You don't see anything, hit zoom, nine. <coughs> what? Bonkers. You have what is called parallel box plots now. All right, you guys, look at those box plots. What do you notice? Is there an outlier? Do you see any outliers? There is no outlier. If you have an outlier, you need to look at your data. There is no outlier. I'm, I'm feeling uneasy. Oh. Jonah is an oopie. Yeah. Do you need these? I do need this. Okay. That works great. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. So, 
If you look at your calculator, guys, you uh, might be looking at it going, oh, that's cool. There's no outliers. There's no strong skewness. Let's move on to do, right? Yeah. No. We get to sketch what we see. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how in the world are you going to know what the numbers are? Hit trace. And you can go left and right and up and down, and you can get the five number summary. Isn't this cool? Oh, it's the bestest ever. All right, so first thing you need is an x axis. What is your lowest minimum between the two? 450. What is your highest maximum between the two? Okay, so we need to get from 450 to 750. What do you want to go by? Tens? That's so extra. We'll go by 50s, I guess. All right. Let's just go by thousands. All right. So I'm going to do, uh, we'll do the one bedroom, which is on the top of your screen. By the way, if you are on your box plots, if you are on the top box plot, you'll see in the top left corner, it should be saying L1. And so that's your uh, reminder that that's your L1 data is on the top. Also, it does top to bottom L1, L2. Okay. All right. So what is the minimum for the one bedroom apartments? That's the 450. What is the Q1, quartile one, for the one-bedroom apartments? 500. What is the median for the one-bedroom apartments? 552.5. Okay. And what is the Q3 for the one-bedroom? 600. And what is the maximum for the one-bedroom? 650. Cool. All right. And then I'm going to connect my little box. And I'm going to do my little whiskers. And then I'm going to make a little label that this is the one bedroom. Okay. And now I'm going to go to the second one. What is the minimum for the two bedroom apartments? 495. What is the Q1 for the two bedroom? 540. What is the median for the two bedroom? Did you hit the down arrow? Yeah. And then you go left and right? 650. What's the median? 650? 622.5. And then the uh, Q3? And then the maximum? Okay, I'm talking this. Y'all were scaring me there for two seconds. <laughs> All right, here's the two-bedroom apartment. Okay. My box plot is almost complete. What am I missing? I need to label my x-axis. What is this? What are, what are these numbers? These are rental rates. All right, cool. All right, guys, so th those are cute and pretty and all that fun stuff. Uh, what should I write? Like, why did I draw this other than because it was fun? It was fun. What, what do I say? What am I doing? Yeah. Very good. No strong skewness. What else? No outliers. So T procedures apply. Basically, I have said my sample data looks normal enough that we can assume it came from a normal distribution. And so my T procedures are going to work. They're good. They're golden. They're ready. All right, now you guys, we've done the normal 
four box plots. Wasn't that exciting? Yes. Now what are we going to do? Do. We're going to do the do, y'all. Does anyone remember the name of this uh, procedure we're using here? Two sample T interval. Two sample T interval. Now that's what our calculator says. Um, you can also call it a two mean T interval. Okay. Um, I, I am 99.9% .9 confident that either one of those is fine. I will verify the other 0.1%. Just in case. All right, so everybody go to, don't clear your calculator. Oh my goodness, gosh gracious. Do not clear your calculator. You want to go to your stat test two sample T interval. And which option is the two sample T interval? It's four. Zero. What is that? That's a two sample T test. Oh, <laughs> so two sample T interval is a stat test zero. Now guys, do we have data or do we have stats? We have data, and guess what? It's already in L1 and L2. God bless America. So what do you need to do? The only thing you need to do is to tell your calculator what the confidence level is that we're using. What is our confidence level? 90%. And what do you say to the pooled question? We're just going to say no for now. We'll figure out why later. So no to the pool. And then there you go. Now, your calculator is going to take a good two, maybe three seconds to calculate it. You'll see, well, okay, because you got that fancy calculator. You'll see, for those of you who have the older calculators, you'll see your calculator thinking. If you look in the top right, you'll see like a like little spinny wheel of death that you get on your computer. You'll see like a little, like a little thing that goes up and down on the far right. Uh, Cause your calculator is doing a whole lot of freaking work right now. Okay. It's got just that degree of freedom formula, right? I mean, come on. So here's the cool thing. You guys look at what your calculator gives you. Not only does it give you the interval, which is what is the low estimate of the difference? <laughs> Negative who what? And what is the upper amount of the difference? 0.76. Okay, so not only does your calculator give you that, you guys, but it also got, went ahead and found the mean of the one bedroom apartments, which was? 554.5. Five, five. It found the standard deviation of the one bedroom apartments, which was? 6.6 All right. And it found the mean of the two bedroom apartments, which was? <laughs> and it found the standard deviation of the two bedroom apartments, which was? It found and it calculated those degrees of freedom. What were your degrees of freedom for this inference procedure? 17.06. Yeah, good enough. Okay. So there you go, you guys. Now, because of the fact that our uh, problem did not give us the summary statistics, we should write down those, that summary. So this is what you should include when you are doing the do part for this problem. Yes. What's the degrees of freedom again? Degrees of freedom uh, for a one sample T interval is N minus one. Yes. And it uh, tells us how many, uh, how much freedom there is in the sample um, for inference. Um, for a two sample, it's a very big giant formula, which is on the back side of this page here that we will never need to calculate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're going to let that calculator do that hard work for us. Okay? All right, cool. Do you guys have any questions about the do part of this? What's left? Oh, wow. <laughs> we already planned. It's time to conclude. Let's conclude. And how do we write the conclude statement for a, a confidence interval? We are 90% confident 
that the interval from negative seven one hundred and seventeen to point now these are dollars by the way this is a difference in dollar amounts to uh point uh what was it Seven six zero four six. What does it do? This interval captures captures the true. Okay, all right. Yes, mean difference in monthly rental rates of one and two bedroom apartments near campus. Oh, could that be any longer of a sentence? Okay. All right, you guys. So we're 90% confident that the difference in the uh, mean apartment rental rates between one and two bedroom apartments is somewhere between negative $117 and basically a dollar. Okay, so there's somewhere between that difference. Now, most of our interval is negative. Therefore, that makes us kind of feel like which value is bigger? The two bedroom, the two bedroom right? Because we did one minus two bedroom. But is there, <clears throat> <clears throat> is there a possibility that the average could be the same? Yes. 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 Yeah. No. No. Yes. Zero is in our interval. Zero is in our interval. So, do we have convincing evidence that there is a difference in the mean monthly rates? Eh, eh, eh. No. Since zero is in our interval. The one and two bed uh, bedroom rate average could be the same. That is due to sampling variability. There could be a, a, a chance that I could go and take a sample of 10 one-bedroom apartments and 10 two-bedroom apartments, and I get an average rental rate that is the same. That could happen. Can we just say no since zeros in our Yeah. All right. What questions do you guys have? Wasn't that exciting? Don't you feel like you've accomplished something? No. Yes. All right, good. Cool. All right. Well, here we go, you guys. Let's finish up. But wait, there's more. Are you kidding me? The, there's more. The National Assessment of Educational Progress Young Adult Literacy Assessment Survey, that's a, quite a survey, interviewed a random sample of 1,917 people, 21 to uh, 25 years old, the sample contained 840 men and 1,077 women. The mean and standard deviation for the scores on the NAEP's test of quantitative skills were X bar 1 equals 272.4 and S of X1 equals 59.2 for the men in the sample. For the women, the results were X bar 2 equals 274.73 and S of X2 equals 57.2. Which of the following shows the 90% confidence interval for the difference in the mean score for males and females, the young adults, males minus females, so that means the males are going to be one, the females are going to be two, and this gives us all of the stats. So what do you have to do here? You just got to plug all this stuff in your calculator. Stat test zero, but this time you have stats. So you're going to go over to stats, and then you're just going to plug everything in in the right place. And you're going to see if you find the interval.
I love that Darren says, oh no. All right. Does anyone have a low estimate for the difference in these two averages? What is the low estimate for, don't look at the choices yet. What is the low estimate for the difference in these numbers? Negative 6.749. And then what is the high estimate for the difference in these scores? All right, ladies and gentlemen, if that's what you got, you got it right. But that doesn't match any of the <laughs> choice questions. So what for art shall we do? Pick the one that's closest. Which one do you think is closest? Put the box around. Obviously, we can do this. Okay, yes. All right. Which one of those is better? B. A. B. A. B. 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 No. B is closer. You box your free response answer, and then you move on. You say, multiple choice writers, you're dumb. This is the answer. Okay, so you would probably go with B. Now, please note, this is because your teacher is a dummy. And uh, I, think I, I think I must have used a 95%. Some, I don't know what I did. But anyways, so it's fine. That won't happen when it's a real multiple choice. So, got it? Okay. All right, cool. Now... We're on to the final countdown. Whew. 95 is not the confidence. I don't know what I did then. Maybe I did pulled. I don't know. Maybe I maybe I did pulled. Check, do 90% with pulled. Is that what I did? No. I have no idea what I did. Then I must have typoed. That has, it had to be a typo then. All right. So here it is. Last question. This is exciting. Most National Football League games on TV last over three hours, but how much actual game time is there in a typical NFL game? Researchers investigated this question as part of a sports analytics class that they taught at Texas Tech University. They carefully watched a random sample of games from the 2019 NFL season and recorded the amount of time from when the ball was snapped to when the referee blew the whistle. Their data produced a sample mean of X bar equals 17.71 and a sample standard deviation of S sub X equals 2.185. The resulting 99% confidence interval for the mu, the true mean amount of game time in all 2019 NFL games, was 14.89 to 20.53. How many games did the researchers watch to make this estimate? Now, I know that many of you would recognize that you need to use the margin of error equals, and you would try to use a T star here because this is a mean problem, and you would maybe want to use a T star, but can you use a T star if you don't know the sample size? Hence why this says to use the Z star to estimate the critical value. It is a mean problem, and many of you on your last test try to use the square root of p, 1 minus p over n, because you thought, well, if she told me to use a z, because that was the same thing that it said on your test, on part c of number one, many of you said, well, she's telling me to use z star, so I have to use the square root of p hat 1 minus p over n, and I have to use a p hat that is equal to 0.5, because that's what Miss Lakey has said, forever and ever and ever, amen. But this is a problem about means. So you need to use the standard error for means, which is S sub X over the square root of the sample size. Now, what about this margin of error? It doesn't give me a desired margin of error because I can find the real margin of error. 
this is just like the problem that was on your test. Mm. So, we'll, we'll just like just so what is the point estimate that is in the middle of this interval? You should know because it was given to you in the problem. 17.71 is the X bar that is the point estimate in this problem. And if you average those two numbers, you will find that it is truly 17.71. But now, what is the margin of error? The distance from that point estimate out to either side. 2.82. That is, what is it? 2.82. All right, so my margin of error is 2.82. The Z star critical value for 99%. Huh? It, you, I think you're very close. Does anyone remember how to do it if you don't know it? So we go 99% in the middle. So we have an area here of 0 0.005 because it's half a percent, right? Okay. So we would do inverse norm of area is 0 0.005. Mean is 0. Standard deviation is 1 because it's a Z because we have to use Z because we can't use T because we don't know N. Whew, so many things. All right. So what is the Z star critical value? Let's do three decimal places. 2.5. 2.576, perfect. Now, what is the S sub X that was actually the standard deviation of the sample in the problem? 2.185 divided by the square root of N, which is what I'm trying to get. And this is algebra. Some of you on your test got this far. You plugged in numbers that were right, actually. And then your wheels fell off with algebra. How do I solve this algebraically speaking, folks? First step, we're going to divide by the Z star critical value of 2.576. Cool. All right, what is 2.82 divided by 2.576? Okay, that equals 2.185 divided by the square root of n. And what do we do now? Okay, we can do a little switcheroo, right? Because here's what's going to happen, y'all. I'm going to multiply by the square root of n, and then I'm going to have to divide by this big long decimal. So I can do the little switcheroo, but I'm switcherooing the entire square root of n comes over here. All right, so... We're going to have now, wee, wee, the square root of n equals 2.185 divided by that big, long, giant oh. decimal number. Okay? And then, once I figure out what that divided by that is, what do I do with that number? Then, then, only then do we square it, young children. And then you have your answer. N equals 3.98, blah, 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 blah. At that point, I don't care. How many games does it appear they watched in order to do this confidence interval? They watched four games. I mean, yeah, I guess you could, uh, at the end of that last game, you can be like, I'm done. All right. That is how you should have done the problem on 1C of your last test, which is probably the only thing that most of you missed on your free response.